Life is short, so smile while you still have teeth. But we as dentists can make people smile confidently even when they don't have any left. Hello everybody and welcome back to our series on prosthodontics by Medical Sutras. In our last session, we discussed about the landmarks of edentulous maxillary arch. In this session, continuing with it, we will be talking about the anatomical considerations of edentulous mandibular arch and we will be discussing these landmarks on an edentulous cast as well as intraorally. Now, GPT-9 defines anatomical landmark as a point of reference and it is further classified as the stress bearing area which include primary and secondary stress bearing areas. The primary stress bearing area for the edentulous mandible is the buccal shelf and the secondary stress bearing areas include the retromolar pads and the alveolar ridges. Next are the peripheral areas and third we have the relief areas which include your secondary stress bearing areas, mandibular tori, the retromyelohyoid ridge and the genial tubercles. So first we will be discussing about the buccal shelf. So the shelf is a dense cortical bone and it lies at right angle to vertical occlusal forces and is therefore a primary stress bearing area for the denture. The buccal shelf is the area between the mandibular buccal frenum and the anterior edge of the masseter muscle. Medially it is bound by the crest of the ridge and laterally by the bony external oblique ridge and distally by the retromolar pad. The buccinator muscle fibers attach horizontally along the bony oblique ridge. As resorption of the ridge occurs, the buccal shelf does not resorb because of its muscular attachments on the posterior and the lateral borders. The width of the shelf area can range from 4 to 6 mm on an average mandible and to 2 to 3 mm or less in a narrow mandible. Now this question was asked in BHU 2012. The buccal shelf lies between the mandibular buccal frenum and the anterior edge of which muscle? And as we have discussed, the answer is D, that is the masseter muscle. Now, this question was asked in AIPG 2021, which muscle participates in the buccinator mechanism? So, first let us understand the buccinator mechanism. The muscles are a potential force whether they are at rest or in active function. The balance between the muscles is responsible for the integrity of the dental arches and the relation of the teeth to the arches. The buccinator mechanism is basically a continuous band of muscle that encircles the dentition and is firmly anchored at the pharyngeal tubercle of the occipital bone. The buccinator mechanism starts with the decusating fibers of the orbicularis oris, joining the right and left fibers of the lip which constitutes the interior component of the buccinator mechanism. Now it runs laterally and posteriorly along the corners of the mouth joining the other fibers of the buccinator muscle which then gets inserted into the pterygomandibular affair. Here it mingles with the fibers of the superior constrictor muscle and then it runs posteriorly and medially to get fixed into the pharyngeal tubercle. Tongue acts opposite to the buccinator mechanism and it exerts an outward force. Any imbalance in this mechanism will lead to a malocclusion and also it will lead to an imbalance or a problem with the stability of the denture. So coming back to our question, which muscle participates in this mechanism? The answer is A, superior constrictor. And next, this was asked in uh, AP 2012. The continuous band of muscle constituting the buccinator mechanism is anchored at and the answer is again a pharyngeal tubercle of the occipital bone. Now this buccinator mechanism will be covered in orthodontics as well. Next we will talk about the retromolar pads which are the secondary stress bearing areas. The retromolar pad is a triangular pad of tissue at the distal end of the residual ridge. Harry Sitcher describes it as a triangular soft elevation of mucosa that lies distal to the third molar. Anterior portion of this triangle is made up of keratinized tissue that is remnant or gingiva of the third molar and it was also termed as the pear shaped pad. The posterior aspect of the triangle is composed of thin non keratinized epithelium, loose connective tissue, glandular tissue, fibers of the temporalis tendon and of the buccinator and superior constrictor muscles 
and also the pterygomandibular affae. The underlying bone is dense cortical because of the muscular attachment and it is resistant to resorption. The denture should cover the retromolar pad because of the support and lack of any long term cortical bone resorption. But to avoid the displacement of denture, the muscle should be activated during border molding by opening wide and closing the mouth against pressure. Clinically, the retromolar pad helps in maintaining the occlusal plane. Uh, we divide the retromolar pad into an anterior two-third and posterior one-third and the posterior height of the occlusal rim should not cross the anterior two-third. It also helps in arrangement of the mandibular posterior teeth. We draw a line from the highest point in the canine region to the apex of the retromolar triangle extending it to the land of the caste. The central fossa of all the posterior teeth should lie on this crestal line. But the teeth should not be placed on the retromolar pad. Next, we will be talking about the residual alveolar ridge. The ridge crest acts as a secondary support area. The lateral walls of the ridges are covered in the final denture because they give stability against lateral displacement and they create a peripheral seal. Now moving on to the peripheral border tissues and the contours. This includes the labial frenum, the labial vestibule, buccal frenum, the distobuccal area and the buccal vestibule, the lingual frenum and the alveololingual sulcus. First is the labial vestibule. It extends from the labial frenum to the buccal frenum. The mucolabial fold extends from the inner aspect of the lip to the mandible. The mentalis muscle inserts very close to the crest of the ridge in this area and limits the border extension in length and width. If the ridge is normal and fine, then the labial flange should be 1-2 to 2 mm thick because a thicker flange will inhibit the movement of lips. But if the ridge is flat, the flanges should be prepared thicker in order to provide a hermetic seal and buccal support. The labial frenum contains fibers of orbicularis oris muscle. Both of these muscles that is mentalis and orbicularis oris are very active and opening of the mouth wide will thin the dimensions of the denture border. The buccal vestibule extends posteriorly from the buccal frenum to the posterior lateral aspect of the retromolar pad. Now we will talk about the action of the masseter and the buccinator muscle. So the distobuccal border of the buccal vestibule is bordered by the vertical fibers of the masseter muscle as we can see and this originates on the zygomatic arch and attaches to the mandible lateral to the buccinator fibers. Occlusal forces will activate the masseter muscle and cause a bulge in the buccinator muscle creating the characteristic masseteric notch in the posterior lateral denture border. During border molding, this muscle can be activated by pushing downward on the patient's chin while the patient attempts to close the mouth against this pressure. Now this question was asked in AIPG 2022. The distobuccal border of the lower complete denture is fabricated by <coughs> the correct answer is A action of masseter on the buccinator muscle. Now we'll talk about the alveololingual sulcus. The alveololingual lingual sulcus can easily be examined when divided into the three areas that is the anterior vestibule or the sublingual crescent area, the middle vestibule or the mylohyoid area and the distolingual vestibule or the lateral throat form or the retromylohyoid fossa. And the anatomical structures that affects the lingual borders will include the genioglossus muscle, the mylohyoid muscle, sublingual gland, superior constrictor muscle, the pterygomandibular raphe, the buccinator muscle and the palatoglossus muscle. First is the sublingual crescent area. Now this area extends from the lingual frenum to the mylohyoid ridge and is mainly influenced by the genioglossus muscle, the lingual frenum and the portion of sublingual gland. GPT-4 describes it as a crescent shaped area on the floor of the mouth that is formed by the lingual wall of the mandible and the adjacent sublingual fold. It is the region of the anterior alveololingual sulcus.
the sublingual crescent area influences the anterior lingual border of the dentra. Lawson suggested that thickening of the sublingual region of the denture will result in an increased retention and this was also supported by Lott and Levin who demonstrated the clinical advantages of thick denture borders. The length of the flange in this area can be adjusted depending upon the tonosity and the activity of the genioglossus muscle and the lingual frenum. Next is the premyelohyoid eminence. In the region of the premolars, on the lingual surface of the mandible, lies the sublingual gland over the mylohyoid muscle between the mandible and the genioglossus muscle. The sublingual gland region is recorded as the premyelohyoid eminence while making an impression with a low viscosity material. The flange of the mandibular denture should provide adequate space for this gland. This is achieved by the flange sloping inwards medially away from the lingual surface of the mandible. The border should rest on the floor of the mouth below the tongue to, accommod to accommodate the sublingual gland. Next is the mylohyoid region. The region of the mylohyoid extends from the premylohyoid fossa to the distal end of the mylohyoid ridge. The border of the mandibular denture extends below the mylohyoid ridge and turns medially away from the lingual surface of the mandible parallel to the mylohyoid muscle fibers to avoid the undercut underneath the mylohyoid ridge and rest over the soft tissues below the tongue. Thus the tongue rests over the flange. When the floor of the mouth is raised, the mylohyoid muscle is activated and contact is established between the border of the mandibular denture and the soft tissues on the floor of the mouth. Now this question was asked in AIMS 2018. Lingual flange of the mandibular denture should extend. The options are up to the mylohyoid ridge and slope towards the tongue, beyond the mylohyoid ridge and slope towards the tongue, up to the mylohyoid ridge and slope towards the ridge, or D, below the level of the mylohyoid ridge and slope towards the ridge. The option is option B, that is beyond the mylohyoid ridge and slope towards the tongue. The average mylohyoid border is approximately 4 to 6 mm beyond the mylohyoid ridge. The width of the flange should be 2 to 3 mm for a good ridge. But if the ridge is flat, it is often advantageous to make th the thickness of the mylohyoid flange as 4 to 5 mm or more. Now we will talk about the retro mylohyoid space. This term was explained by Edwards and Boucher. The mucous membrane and the superior constrictor forms the retromyelohyde curtain of Edwards and Boucher. The region of the retromyelohyde curtain influences the distolingual flange of the mandibular denture. The lateral throat form or the retromyelohyde space, it is bounded anteriorly by the mylohyoid muscle, laterally by the pear-shaped pad, posterolaterally by the superior constrictor muscle and posteromedially by the palatoglossal muscle and medially by the tongue. The medial pterygoid muscle lies posterior to the superior constrictor. When the mandible is elevated, the contracting medial pterygoid will push against the fibers of the superior constrictor and this action creates a bulge in the wall of the retromyelohyoid curtain. Now this, along with the strong intrinsic and extrinsic tongue muscles, relocates the retromyelohyoid borders laterally. This will complete the so-called S-shaped curvature of the lingual flange of the mandibular denture. Now, this is basically a synopsis of everything that we have discussed till now, the factors and its effect on the stability of the mandibular denture. So, first is the buccal shelf support area. If it is flat and large, then the prognosis is good. But an inclined, narrow and concave will lead to a bad prognosis. If the tongue position is normal, we have good prognosis. But if it is positioned backward, bad prognosis. The buccal pad of fat, if it is in the masseteric notch of the denture, the prognosis is good. However, if it is not, then the bad prognosis is bad. The tonosity of the tissue, resilient cheek and lip tissues will lead to a good prognosis and good stability. But firm cheek and lip tissues will lead to a bad prognosis. For tissues under the denture, if they are firm, if they are supported by connective tissue, then it will lead to a better function of the denture. But if they are mobile, thin and inelastic, then we have a bad prognosis. 
the distance in between the arches and the occlusal vertical height should be sufficient the structure of the sublingual fold area should be prominent the position of the tongue should be normal that is the tip of the tongue should be along the lower uh, should be touching the lower teeth the buccal fat pad we have already talked about now this concludes our discussion about the anatomic landmarks of the mandible we will see you again with our discussion on jaw relations as one of our subscribers has asked in the comment section till then if you found this video helpful and informative then do like the video and share it with your friends and also subscribe the channel for more such content also you can download our app medical sutras for more such detailed notes on dental and medical topics you can also comment below any other topics that you want to be covered in future